Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don joined today by one of our, our new members of our team who's been working with us. That's Eric Bond. So, Eric, do you want to say hi to the good listeners? Hi there, good listeners. There you go. He just channeled his inner Chris Capola there by just repeating back what I said. So uh, you have to get more clever at how I do these, these questions that set up, <clears throat> set up our co-hosts and set up our guests. And <clears throat> we're happy to have you join us today. Today, we're going to... I'm actually, I was telling just, I was tell, telling Eric off podcast, I'm somewhat excited about this topic. First of all, because it's going to a place we don't often go in the time scheme of things. And we're trying to diversify our time schemes and <clears throat> our approaches here on a fork in time. But also because the, the more I thought about this particular fork, and Eric and I were just talking about this, this fork has legs. This fork has legs that go and go and go and go and go. It's almost going to be hard to know where to stop and contain it. So it probably is going to come back around and have a second episode uh, or maybe a third episode at some point, because I can think of some, some offshoots of this. Uh, but the topic today, Eric, how would you best describe the topic? Is it about the person or is it about the battle before we tell our listeners what we're going to be dealing with here? What, do you think more about the event or more about the persona here in your head? Well, Don, I hope you don't mind me going. <laughs> As you know, I have a background in theater and writing, so I did write a whole <laughs> little speech to give uh, <laughs> last night while I was waiting for my clothes to finish in the washer. <laughs> okay. Bring it on. Okay. <clears throat> I want you to imagine yourself by a river embankment in Turkey. The year is 334 BCE, it's around May. This was supposed to have made it all worthwhile. The grief, the insults, the killings, all was to have been swallowed up by the success of this invasion. Yet at this first battle, Alexander had been stunned by the strike of some barbarian he couldn't have guessed the name of. It was Spithridates, and was now to die by their hand. For the first time in his Sober life, doubt crept in. What if he were not the son of Zeus? What if his mother's dreams had been just that? Cerebral visions conjured by some half-digested pomegranate one evening. In those lingering eons with thin Spithridates' next swipe, Alexander prayed, Zeus, Hyes, if ever my stock was grown from the furrow you fertilized, before the prayer could be finished, the blade fell with the rest of Spithridates' arm into the mud of the embankment. Cleitus, bodyguard and family friend from atop his horse, had saved the young Alexander. The end of that day would see the Persian forces fall back and their Greek mercenaries executed or sold into slavery. This was the beginning of the end of the Achaemenid Persia. By the end of the campaign, Alexander will be hailed as Shana Shah of Persia, Pharaoh of Egypt, and nothing less than a living god. Cleitus, the savior of Alexander, would be dead, killed by Alexander in one of many alcohol-induced rage. Apparently, reminding any divinely ordained princeling of mortal parentage was not kosher even then. Alexander would die of a fever at age 32, 10 years after this engagement. Largely, this has been attributed to typhoid as godliness does not always follow cleanliness for hegemons. Years of military anarchy would follow in his wake, seeing the creation of four separate kingdoms, the extinction of House Argead, and the creation of Hanukkah. But what if Alexander the Great had time to finish his prayer? Zeus Haiz, if ever my stock was grown from the furrow you fertilized, reveal my lineage. With that, the gods answered. As Alexander fell to the ground, he heard the cry of Cleitus and the song of blades before another shout and Spithridates dead beside him. 
Alexander was now in the arms of Cleitus. Much as Alexander had been after feeding from his wet nurse, Cleitus' own daughter, Lenike. From a distance, you could be almost forgiven for thinking the old soldier was Alexander's grandfather. Almost forgiven. For Alexander knew himself to be made of far better stuff. Still, it was comforting to be held so again. All that spoiled the moment was the coin the old man kept pushing into Alexander's mouth. Defiant to the end, Alexander spat out the coin and using his Herculean strength, pulled himself up to the old man. The son of Zeus is payment enough. Before collapsing onto Sharon's deck, the third Alexander saw his father's monocular visage reflected in Cletus's ruddied eyes. Prayer answered. I don't know. What do you think? Too dramatic? Uh, not too dramatic because I think, uh, you know, if, uh, if there's anything we can say about uh, Alexander the Great, who obviously this is about for those that didn't, that didn't pick up on that, and the mm -hmm. Battle of Granicus being the scene there on that hill in, hill in Turkey, um, he's a pretty dramatic figure. He's one of those historical figures that is, uh, you know, when they talk about larger than life, Alexander sort of, you know, could be the, 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 could be the picture in the dictionary when you're talking about a figure that's larger than life. I mean, there's, well, how, there's a lot of people that are called the great, but even among, if you were to go among the greats, Alexander probably wins out among the great of the greats. If you were to, you know, sort of go to round two of the greats playoff, you know, he hits that and there's a lot of drama and there's a lot of characters. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's too much. Too much drama for Alexander because Alexander was all about the drama, Eric. Oh, yeah. I just, as I was telling you off podcast, I don't really go for the great man model of history often. But if there's one person who really makes that argument, it is Alexander the Great. I agree. And, and I think that's one of the more, more interesting reasons why I wanted to go down this particular historical what if is. I'm not a big believer in the, the great man theory either. I believe much more in the forces of history, you know, kind of approach or the forces of history in a circle. I'm making a, a, a wheel here in the air because that you know <laughs> tends to be what it is. I know you can't see that on the podcast, but that's what I was doing is um, I think you're right. Alexander is maybe the exception that maybe is what causes people to think there is a rule. Might be a good way to describe it is that he is he is the exception because what you described there. All of the things that happened, conquering Persia, pushing all the way to India, conquering Egypt, all is, is done in a decade. I mean, it's done in this incredibly tight, short, um, um, you know, period of time. And um, to me, that's also fascinating. And it, it's done by someone who is so young. To me, how fast it happens and how young he is are the two things that always, you know, that always strike me. Just yeah, to give a little I, bit, go ahead. I did have to reassure my older sister when I was talking to her about the recording. Uh, she said, it really is amazing. What am I doing with my life, Eric? She is turning 30. And I said, please understand this was a vastly different time and you are not the member of a Macedonian royal family. And yeah. that seemed to comfort her. Yeah, it's, it, it is incredible because, uh, and, and, you know, and life was sh generally shorter then, Pe you know, just in general, lifespans tended to be shorter. It was, you know, people didn't live as long, even, even, you know, even great figures, you know, it's not uncommon for them to die. And what we think of today as being middle age, middle age was, you know, in some ways an older age then, uh, but Alexander stands out. I mean, he starts this conquest, you know, barely, barely in his 20s. You know, by the time he's in his early 30s, it's over, over, you might argue prematurely, you know, that's a whole other thing. And then the whole other interesting thing, and again, you know, we're going to be mainly talking about the fork here, but, you know, Alexander brings a lot of that, what happened, why it ends so quickly on himself. You're talking about how many times there were, you know, drunken fits and rages and all of the other things that happened with that. He's a, he's a larger than life character by the historical accomplishments and just by who he is as a person, you know, too. He, he, he again, I don't think it's too dramatic. It's Alexander. Oh yeah. Uh, just to get into brass tacks. So Alexander of Macedon, he is the, he's not the sole surviving child of Philip II of Macedon, but he is the best qualified. He has been training as a cavalryman under his father. 
and after his father's assassination at a wedding, which is probably the worst father of the bride moment I could think of. So bear in mind that, Don. Yeah. Don't get assassinated. Uh, he fo- is following through on Philip's plans of invading Persia, ostensibly for the goal of retaking lost Greek possessions and gr- Greek identified city states back into the Corinthian League that his father had formed. Yeah. And then things kind of go out of control from there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there's a couple of interesting things in there. Again, we'll, I'll include a lot of links in the show notes for this particular podcast because it's too much backstory with too many details to really, you know, spend on. We, we could spend three hours on the what did and still not give the what did anything close to its proper due. But uh, you used, a, we talked about this a little bit off podcast, you used a couple of things there that are interesting. He's, Ma- he's Macedonian. He's from Macedon. So... Greek, not Greek, Eric. I'm going to say not Greek. Like they, they are as I coined the term to you earlier, Greek adjacent. Like they believe in the same. I guess it really depends on where we want to cut it. Is it the fact that they worship similar gods that have the names and the legends associated with them? then yeah, I guess they're Greek as much as being Greek meant anything to the Greeks themselves at that time. Yeah. But there's also the fact that they were a former vassal of the Persian Empire. They practiced a polygamous marriage, at least among their kings, which is more of a Persian tradition at that time. So it's one of those like eh, apples and oranges. Yeah, and, and, and they're just north of what we think of as being classic Greece or where you normally think of Greece being around the Aegean. So geographically, they're adjacent. Culturally, they're adjacent, as you said, uh, sharing the same sort of, you know, traditions and heritage and religion and to some degree culture. But even the Greeks themselves, what we think of as the classic Greek city states, Athens, Sparta, you know, Thebes, um, these are not all homogeneous the, the, the greek culture means different things because these are city states united by a language and a common religious tradition for the most part and yes some common culture but there's unique elements to that culture spartan culture is different than athenian culture for example and mm-hmm. that that plays out when now you talk about these i think the macedonians is i think greek adjacent is the perfect world geographically and then also culturally yeah, you know, the, I, I guess they come to the Olympic Games, so they're Greek enough to come to the Olympic Games, right? You know, but they're, um, Philip is an outsider, even when he's uniting Greece in this effort to go and do something with respect to the, leading the League of Corinth. He's sort of an outsider that comes in and takes advantage of the League of Corinth and the need for this strong man to come in to even assume a position of responsibility in Greece proper. Right. I, I think I was trying to think of different historical events to as a means of having good analogies for the audience. So Greek uh, Greece being a series of city states that are competing is very similar to say uh, the state the city states of Italy during the Renaissance, even up to uh, the 19th century before forming a coherent national body, which Philip II really was the spearhead of that in that he's created this Corinthian League of all of these different city-states, except Sparta. Sparta eventually is kind of joined in by the pressure of being surrounded, essentially. But he's unified these peoples who are notoriously difficult to govern at the time it was seen as like yeah Greece, the hellenistic kingdoms are so independently minded they could never unite against each uh with each other because eventually they'll turn right and and the only thing that does tend to, to unite them is an external pressure that unites them in a temporary fashion uh you know it's very um when it's expedient they're united only until it you know, loses the expediency. And so they have had this long running, multiple over the centuries, 
ongoing, on again, off again, but even when it was off again, the pressure was there with the Persians. So for example, you know, we mentioned the Olympics, an Olympic event that we have in the modern Olympics is the marathon. Well, that commemorates, commemorates a really weird thing to me. It commemorates the 26 and a fraction mile run of a messenger from the Battle of Marathon outside Athens to relay the word to the city of Athens that they've won. He ran so far so fast that then he dies. So let's make a sporting event out of that. That makes perfect sense. But um, that oh. was the case of the Persians coming to invade. The, the Greeks had turned the Persians back at Marathon. That's one of the other instances where they unite against the common enemy. In this case, it's Persian. Well, not only that, that the messenger died saying the word Nike, which means victory. And then we decided, like, let's do a shoe brand over a man's <laughs> last words before, you know, he exhausted himself to death. <laughs> right. The, That's the, our brand. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. Yeah. Just realized here, <clears throat> as I was going along, I can see Eric and Eric couldn't see me. So I, he, I was doing like a circle in the air and inside I realized I'm seeing that, but Eric didn't see Diddley. So now Eric I, can see I me. I got to see your lovely headshot. And I was yeah. just like, wow, he got a, a really nice one. All mine look just i don't know if it's just because it's like i'm there while it's being taken so to me it's just like well this looks homemade yeah i uh, <laughs> it just uh, i think it's actually the same headshot that i use uh, for those if you haven't visited the website that's a good enough reason to visit the website it's the same shot that i use on my on my on my zoom meetings that's there on the, it, it's about 10 years old and I'm, I'm 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 a few pounds lighter we'll just leave it at that uh <laughs> in terms of what's there and probably a, a few hairs browner versus gray so again the setup is this is the first major battle that's happened in alexander's contract conquest that we know eventually he will he will take over persia he will take over egypt push towards india all the things that eventually become you know alexander's success but uh, this is early on. You, you mentioned it's 334. Again, you got to remember we're counting backwards here, which is something that always challenges me a little bit when I'm thinking about wow. BCE. But literally, Alexander, who's taken up the cause that initially had been put forward by his father, Philip, is um, they have just crossed over into what we think of today as modern Turkey, Asia Minor. And so, in fact, this battle happens very close to what we eventually know to be the location of the of uh, of uh, the city of Troy. So it, that, it, it's literally that close to the Aegean. Uh, Alexander has just managed to get his army across the Hellespont there to get out, you know, to get across onto onto uh, into Asia, onto Asia Minor. We're very, very, very short distance removed. This is not five years into the what essentially would be the 10 year conquest. This is months into the journey that's eventually going to become Alexander's conquering of, you know, the quote unquote, most of the known world at that particular point in time. Uh, you mentioned before he's he's trained as a as a writer. He's basically been trained. His father trained him not as an entry as an infantryman as to command an army, although he was certainly trained from very early on to be someone who is going to be militarily capable in terms of command, but he has a famous horse that's a very large war horse. And throughout most of the military action that we see Alexander involved in, he rides into battle with the, with the Greek cavalry. Now they have another, or the Macedonian cavalry, they have other uh, very often um, adjunct units that are cavalry units that are part of either mercenary cavalry or other that are there but th this cat this particular cavalry that he leads is called the companion cavalry they're like the elite special forces uh inside of alexander's army which has a lot of different functional elements to it and because alexander commands and leads from on horseback one of the things that always has struck me from a military standpoint is his tactics strategically even his tactics but certainly tactically in a battle seem to always be very very dependent upon speed alexander and his army is about doing things quickly faster than the enemy can in most instances yeah. and a lot of that i think comes from the fact that alexander's mounted when he come, when he comes into the situation he's mobile and so he expects mobility to be part of what what his forces are doing yeah, and that is also very key to understanding even Alexander's personality. He is 
a deeply competitive, impulsive person. This first battle goes against his second in command's own advice of just like, let's, we've just crossed the hell spawn into this area. Let's take the night off. We're by this river, uh, Granicus. And he tells him off of like, am I going to be afraid of crossing a mere stream after crossing an ocean? Right. And this has also unfortunately been Alexander's kind of weak point as a leader and a diplomat on top of being a really good warrior is the fact that he's so impulsive. Sometimes he just talks his mouth off. His father tried to murder him at his wedding, at his father's wedding, because somebody made a joke about like, oh, we'll have a full Macedonian heir now. And Alexander threw a wine goblet at them and said, what am I, a bastard then? And his father tried to stop the fight, uh, stop the fight or murder Alexander by drawing his sword. And then he slipped and Alexander said, and this is the man to cross uh, into Persia. He can't even cross a series of couches. And then Alexander had to go in hiding for a few months because right. <laughs> like I said, he is not a cautious man. <laughs> right. And, and I think that's an important thing to understand because that's, that's what a lot of this particular fork will hinge upon as we get to it is, um, you know, when you're successful, it's daring. When it's not successful, it's, um, you can assign other words to it. You know, it's foolishness or it's, you know, it, it, when it's, it's, it's being lack of caution or whatever you want to it. He very, he, he's impulsive. It's, it's impulsive when it works. It's foolhardy when it doesn't, right? Right. And, and he very much has that personality. And I think part of that is because of, like you said, his temperament, what went on there in the household, contesting with others inside of even Philip's household for position because of his mother being, as you mentioned there, being an outsider and all the things that go with that. And then the, the other part of it is he's, he's gotten some pretty interesting tutoring. He's gotten some pretty interesting training in his life. You know, his, he didn't just go to, you know, he didn't have a tutor, didn't just have a tutor. His tutor is <laughs> kind of well-known, <laughs> you know, he, it, it's, it's this guy, you may have heard of him. His name is, um, Aristotle, perhaps you've heard of him, you know, that, that's, who, that's who his personal tutor is, you know, that, that, that's what, who he goes to class with every day is one of the great philosophers of Western thought, just happens to be the guy that's been hired to, to tutor Alexander, you know, from his young age. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he understands he's been exposed to philosophy and history and obviously military prowess. And it's, without chasing it too far here, his father is known for being something of a military genius in terms of reorganizing how the, the weapons would be used and how the, the, the phalanx would be used. What we know of as much of, of Greek infantry tactics come from things that, Ma that Macedonia brought into play because of Alexander that come from his father, Philip. And so it's, it, there's a lot of this going on, as you described in your injured dramatic intro to the... Uh, to the actual field of battle is they arrive at the battle late in the day. Uh, the Persians already have the high ground on the other side of a river. Cla everything about classic military strategy says, don't rush into battle here. It's not going to work well for you to rush into battle here. The enemy has a better position. You've got to cross this river to get to them. Uh, you have, you're just coming off the march, just coming off of where you've been to get here they've been waiting for you the time to it you need to wait stop assess the situation maybe tomorrow you figure out how you're going to deal with this not the alexander that we see show up right eric <laughs> as you pointed no. out he, he he rides into the situation uh sort of throws caution to the wind and very quickly decides to launch the companion cavalry that he's leading into a crossing of the river at an angle in such a way that he eventually dislodges the Persian forces, creates an opening for the rest of his army. Uh, there are several YouTube videos that I've watched on the battle that I'll attach. I'll let, I'll let our listeners go and watch those or listen to those to get a better sense of the actual tactical thing here. But what happens is pretty much because of that approach, it turns into an open field, free-flowing melee <laughs> between the forces 
And Alexander is out there as he often is on his horse, riding around engaged in the combat. So this is now getting us up to the historical what did and, and the breaking point. You described it here. Clitus is his, or Cleitus is his, basically his chief bodyguard, as I understand it, but an older advisor to him as well. What exactly happens there, Eric? So what happens there is during the course of the battle, Alexander is essentially drawing as much attention to himself as possible for the Persian cavalrymen who are stationed, most of whom are governors of different provinces in the surrounding area. And each one is kind of vying to be, let's say, the star of the show on this one. And whoever can kill Alexander is going uh, to bring a lot of glory to themselves and to their noble house. So Alexander, he's kind of riding crazily all around the field really just trying to draw the cavalry to him anywhere he goes. One of the Persians, uh, Spithridates, who I described, is able to strike Alexander's hel helmet, and that stuns him. For a moment, he's dazed, he's confused. He's another 70s movie I can't think of, or a movie about the 70s. And he's struck on the head, he's stunned, he's unable to respond, and Spithridates is just about to land another blow and kill him, more than likely, when Spithridates' arm gets lopped off by Cleitus. Cleitus is able to make it there in time. Now, if you look up Cleitus, he's going to be called Cleitus the Black, because later there will be a Cleitus the White, who I guess was famous enough that they thought we need to differentiate the other Cleitus. So, we're just going to call him Cleitus because Cleitus the White doesn't matter. And I'm just imagining Gandalf robes on this dude. <laughs> that was the thing that popped into my head. Uh, the gray, the white, you know, what, what's, what's the color of the wizard right now, right? Is, yeah. uh, is part of what's there. But yeah, there's that, you know, this well, the movie has been made. Uh, I guess uh, Oliver Stone made the most recent version of a story of Alexander. So uh um, it, it has been done recently, but obviously this sounds like something, again, we talked about the drama of it, that plays well, you know, the, 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 the blow is about to be landed and it's, it's a great action scene. He comes along and, you know, lops off the arm of the, uh, that's got the sword that's about to strike the leader, about to strike Alexander. As a result, the, again, Macedonians, the Greeks will go with Greeks here. They carry the day, they win the battle. Right. And, and, and in a pretty convincing fashion. And because of that, um, the invasion is going to continue. And in fact, they, uh, they solidify some of the position there. They do capture uh, some of the Persian leaders. As you mentioned, um, uh, Spithridates is, uh, I guess he's like a satrap. He's, he's, a, he's a provincial ruler. So he's, uh, he, when he's killed, it's, but, you know, there's others like him that are there that are valuable hostages and they're able to use and, and negotiate here. Eventually what's going to happen is they're actually going to come into contact with the rest of the Persian main force. There's going to be another big battle that they're successful with and you know, cut to the chase, cut to the end. Alexander sweeps across um, Anatolia, a Asia Minor, sweeps down the coast as we think of it today along the eastern edge of the Mediterranean through modern um, Lebanon, Israel, into Egypt, conquers Egypt, heads over to the Persian Empire, the areas that had been Babylon and every other place, and eventually pushed further into India. Eventually, as you mentioned, about 10 years later, he's going to die with questionable reasons. You know, was it poisoning? Was it, was it, you know, what exactly was it? But he dies a young man, and the point that we're going to take as our fork here, which I guess we should get to, it is a fork in time, is we're going to talk about what would have happened if um, uh, Clytus or Clytus does not intervene. So Alexander dies. So Alexander dies at the Battle of Granicus. Yeah. So if that's our fork, one of two things I think can happen there. You have to decide whether there's going to continue to be a military action led by somebody else. We're already here. We brought the army. We're going to keep going or it's going to stop. I have my opinion on that, Eric. What is your opinion on that? So my opinion, also I I keep 
liked wanting to call Cleitis Cletus, just because I think that would be funnier. But Cleitus, yes, he, if he's just, a, if he's killed early on, or if he's just somehow delayed and Alexander is dead, my personal take is I think the army at that point, because Alexander has left Macedonia without an heir. He's just put one of his father's favorite generals in charge and kind of blows off the whole concern about having an heir thing until later on. He doesn't get married, at least until his late 20s. He's 22 right now, and he'll die at 32. He's got 10 years to work with. So I think Parminion, who is Alexander's army is very difficult because there's not a set rank structure. It is very much just the orbit of whoever Alexander's favorite is at the moment, which comes to be known as who Alexander is going to have assassinated next because he eventually assassinates a lot of them. But Parminion is Alexander's chief strategist. He's the more cautious general I had alluded to earlier, where he's more, let's go by the book, let's save up on the strength of our army and we'll fight tomorrow, Alexander uh, does not listen to him and starts the Battle of Granicus. And this will repeat several other battles and it kind of becomes a joke of anytime Parminion says, let's not do this, let's take it easy right now, Alexander will say, let's rush in and we'll win. So I think Parminion being this strategist, being more cautious, will probably say we need to withdraw back to uh, our side of the Hellspont because as much as I think the battle would still be won, I think it would be more of a draw in that case because their chief commander is dead. They need to get back because as soon as everybody hears Alexander is dead, it will be a free for all, which it was in our own timeline. It's important to understand, as you pointed out, you know, why would there be a desire to pull back? Antipater has been put in the um, in command back in Macedonia. He's basically serving as regent while Alexander is away. He doesn't have a claim to the throne. He just happens to be one of the, uh, you know, one of the, as you said, his father's count, one of his counselors, one of his military leaders. And so there's, a, you know, before we can push into Persia, we got to go back and make sure the home front is well taken care of. So that's why you may see the withdrawal immediately back and no further action that takes place. I think that's the most likely thing that would have happened is essentially the invasion would have come to an end or it would have been delayed. It would have, it would have been different or, or, or would have taken a different form. And so Alexander's forces now with Alexander dead, I think you're right, probably do win the day. They take the battle because of how it's progressing along. But there's not there's not this feeling of we should continue on. And in fact, what does tend to happen as I read Alexander's history moving forward is that, you know, victory breeds the desire for more victory and recklessness proven to be successful breeds more recklessness. And so that it's sort of this self-fulfilling snowball effect that gets rolling along here where that you don't have that. <laughs> you don't have Alexander, first of all, and then you don't have that with the army as a whole with its persona because Alexander is not there to deliver that persona to the, you know, to the game. Yeah, Alexander, for people of my generation, Alexander has no withdrawal strategy, if right. you want to think of that. He has no end point. He just keeps moving the goalposts and eventually he just ran out of space. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in fact, one of the reasons that even his death is sometimes attributed by some historians to the possibility of being poisoned was his own men are like, we've been at this for eight years, nine years, 10 years. It's time to go home. And so, but Alexander just wants to keep, you know, still sort of keep going despite some of the difficulties, particularly the latter, the latter part of that, what they run into in um, modern day Afghanistan, what they run into in parts of, of modern day Iran. And uh, he has an army, most of, a large portion of his army um, dies of thirst by trying to cross a desert portion that's there that they're not well equipped for. Is that that very, as you said, he, he has no stop to it. He just keeps going and going and going and going. That drove the success of the campaign. But without Alexander, that's not the nature, I think, of the campaign, particularly if you look at somebody, as you well describe. Uh, like a like a Parmenian who was 
particularly in the histories, it's almost like he's the counterpoint to Alexander. He's almost like he's written to be the voice of reason, you know, to Alexander's rashness. It's almost like it's set up as a character, but a very different a very different Macedonian army under, if it does continue along under Parmenian versus under Alexander, no doubt. Right. So I think what would be best for us to proceed is we first start with like, so what happens to Greece in the aftermath? Because the army comes back, the army is composed of all of these different city states who have sent like their noblemen, their elites of their society. And what we have is we have Antipater back in Macedonia. We have uh, the mother of Alexander Olympias, who is still like a power broker to a certain extent. Alexander has no wife. He has no, he doesn't even have an illegitimate heir at this point. His closest male relative that has the same father is uh, Arhideus who becomes Philip III in our own timeline, but he's described as being mentally handicapped. They don't really say what the exact symptoms were, just that for whatever reason, he's unable to uh, operate in the way a king needs to during that time. And eventually he got assassinated as well. We have Cleopatra, who is Alexander's full sister, who has married her uncle, Alexander Molossus, who I'm just going to call Molossus because it (laughs) sounds creepy enough to justify an uncle marriage. And he is from uh, Olympias' home country of Epirus, and they will have a son, uh, Neoptolemus, who is really the only heir, but he is the king of Epirus and maybe has no claim to the throne under conventional circumstances, which takes father only paterfamilias. Yeah. And and, and again, the, uh, the Cleopatra here is not the Cleopatra of, you know, who will be played later by Liz Taylor fame, but that name is descended from this because of what happens in the real timeline and and eventually what happens in Egypt. So I think you're right. There's there's a lot of it's not it's not even clear what happens back in in Macedon when they get back there. <laughs> that, that that's a coin flip, right? Uh, let alone anything else. Uh, for all the reasons that you've just described, there's not a clear air. There's there's different things. Uh, if you if you watch the um, was Oliver Stone the director of the movie that I'm thinking about of uh, of Alexander? I think that he was. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, if I'm wrong, the listeners will know that I'm wrong, but I, I know that Alexander's mother, Colin Farrell, plays Alexander in that movie. I know that much. Right. Alexander's, Ale- I think you know Eric who plays his mother in that film, right? I have never seen the movie actually. Oh, yeah. this is Angelina Jolie plays uh, Angelina plays her. Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie plays her. That sort of tells you everything. And I've seen the movie once. It's it's a little bit strange and, and goes down some of the interesting sort of just theories about Alexander as well. But I think you're right. The first place that the fork is noticeably different is just back home in, in Macedon. It's not even clear that there would be, because in the, as you point out, 10 years later in the real timeline, there's confusion about this. And that's with 10 years of things to get a little bit better solidified by Alexander's off being successful and more time to go by. So it, it, it's not even a given that we, that, that Macedon is anything of, you know, influence with, without an Alexander or without what, what would flow, you know, from having a regular heir to the throne there. Yeah. I think my best guess right now, just based on what we know of our own history and drawing conclusions from that is I think Antipater, who's much younger now than he had than he was when he had to deal with the interregnum crisis of Alexander's later death and was very keen to not install himself as a hereditary monarch. I think I... now that he's young enough to at least be more effective, he will have a few years under the hood. He is young enough that he will maybe, I don't know if he marries Olympias, but I think he would try to install himself as at least the head of uh Macedon, 
And even though they don't have the tactical brilliance of Alexander, how much you want to say that was brilliance and how much it was having better tech, because they have the, what's it called? The Sirius? The Sirius? Mm -hmm. The, uh, you know, uh, again, the way that, that, as I understand it, the way that Philip had altered um, the weapons that were used by the the, the phalanx and how it was, you know, he modified that gave them better reach and and lethality inside of what had been the traditional way for Greek infantry to work. Right. Uh, to just describe for the listeners, so basically there would be this weird tug of war match in most battles where you are essentially trying to push the other person off. Maybe there's a different game for that. I don't know. Consult Squid Game. Uh, but since it was mostly these shield walls of ph- uh, phalanxes, uh, Philip II introduced kind of this longer spear, almost that 10-foot pole we hear about with the Grinch, which would be better able to skewer your opponents while also providing protection to your own soldiers. So these were massive, like, long pikes. So Antipater, who is now in control of the Macedon forces, has to put down essentially the rest of Greece. And I think technologically, and at least militarily, he has the means of doing that to establish this kingdom. But I do think it will not last past him having this control. Yeah, it it would be another short-lived domination by one element of what was widely, we talked about the Greek Jason thing, widely Greek over something else that's Greek. And this happened, you know, for centuries where there would be one of the city states would rise to a level of ascendancy, exert a little control or influence over the others, but it never lasted forever. There never was a unified Greece in the sense of becoming, you know, anything close to what we think of as being the modern nation state, certainly, which would have been rare for that time. It's not modern. (laughs) Uh, So hence not the modern nation state, but very much still, I think your analogies were good talking about, you know, the Italian city states, even later, if you want to pull it down for maybe some of our listeners, think about the, um, the, um, the, what eventually become, become the states in the Americas, the, the colonies, you know, Virginia is very different than, uh, than a Massachusetts or Rhode Island or Pennsylvania. They have their own care, you know, they eventually, we eventually it becomes the United States, but they're still states. They still have their unique character what's there. To me, the other interesting branch of this is just really the rest of what flows from that, because if you think about the next, you know, just conservatively, let's talk about the next 300 years. Let's just let's just talk about the next three centuries. OK, you know, kind, kind of thing. We'll yeah, just yeah, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. But, you know, what happens in the next three centuries is when Alexander does die, the empire, which he had formed the area that he'd conquered you know we called it an empire it really wasn't even in my mind an empire yet it was the areas that he had conquered because it wasn't like it had been ruled yet as a unified anything because he's basically still off pulling it together yeah he's what he does manage he's using the persian model of essentially you have your own government within your own ethnic group or your own cultural group and you're left as long as you say Yes, we ex- we acknowledge there is a higher king than us, right. but we mostly manage our own affairs. And as long as it doesn't interfere with the foreign policy of the state, then it's fine. Kind of like uh, the Articles of Confederation government. Uh, I think that's kind of- a good way to think about it. And as long as you pay your your duties, your taxes, you know what's owed to the to the to the central authority, you're good to go. But what happens when Alexander dies is his empire you know what he had put together is divided by four of his generals into four separate spheres well one of them actually is the home sphere what goes on back in you know in macedon but two the two big ones that i think of are seleucus and ptolemy who are two of his generals and ptolemy ends up taking egypt which had been conquered and so the egypt that we know (laughs) Uh, by the time we get to Roman interaction with Egypt. Now we're talking about the other Cleopatra when Julius Caesar shows up and the other things that are there and even what happens in the period after the fall of Alexander's empire and before the rise of Roman domination is when we we see Egypt, for example, 
uh, if you look at Christian history in the in the new the New Testament Egypt that's referred to there is Ptolemaic Egypt. Yeah. Um, uh, what is north of of the area that sort of contended between um, you know that's that's the Holy Land today. This area that was Palestine is contended and goes back and forth of as, as it did over a lot of history. But it goes back and forth between Ptolemaic Egypt and the Seleucid Empire, which is in the area that we think of as being sort of modern day Syria today. These are two of um, Alexander's generals who took control of those areas. Well, for the next two to three hundred years, those are the rulers of those areas. As a result of that, and Egypt is the one that I immediately think of. Egyptian culture, religion becomes this weird sort of mix of Greek and Egyptian, you know, things that all sort of get mixed together. Alexander had founded the city of, in, in Egypt, Alexandria, uh, which was, you know, the Greek influence that was there. It becomes a center of Greek philosophical types of thought. Egypt stops being Egypt. Egypt becomes this Hellenized, the term that we use there for, yeah. you know, the Greek becomes a Hellenized version of Egypt that happens because of Alexander. And it doesn't happen if there's not something like an Alexander. And so pretty much everything you know about Egypt from, you know, the late um, fourth century BC on is Alexander's influenced Egypt, not the Egypt that existed before. Right. And the Ptolemies were able to cement their control largely by uh, kind of syncretizing their customs. Like, for instance, they practiced familial marriage. Right. You would call it inbreeding. And it's inbreeding. And it it becomes a, a mess. It's basically the whole of Alexander's collapse solidified into one state where the royal family is constantly just in a series of assassination attempts, where a family reunion could either be a wedding or it could be a murder party. And you're never- Or, or, or both, you know. Or both. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that becomes, that's the influence of, that's the influence of Alexander. It plays out in a very different way, but without Alexander, conquering and then even upon his death his generals taking over and greek culture as you said being infused inside of that uh there's a different egypt there's a different uh what we think of as modern day turkey or syria the anatolia area is different because of that um the the world the the eastern mediterranean becomes again the, the term that we use is hellenized it, it, it's it's it becomes greek uh greek becomes the language and it sort yeah. of was the language before, but it definitely becomes the language, even so much so that once these areas are now under Roman control, it's still, and the argument can be made, the Romans sort of just borrowed and stole Greek culture anyway, because they didn't have much of their own to begin with. They certainly did that in a lot of religion. You know, a lot of the Roman, a lot of the Roman gods are just the Greek gods renamed or, or reimagined to a degree. Oh, is, is, it gets is, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it becomes an existential concern for the Romans that they have to syncretize. Like when they met the Gauls, they had to they had to translate their gods into something that matched their own. So that way, because they believed that if they took over an area and they didn't pay respect to the gods, it would be cataclysmic. That's right. what the only exception they would grant was to, you know, for folks of my tradition, of the Jewish tradition, who, because we had an ancient belief system, we got kind of a pass on it. Right. And for the people uh, who are living in Judea and Israel at the time, I can't remember if they are one united kingdom or still two separate kingdoms, but they themselves do not have any contact with Alexander directly. They pretty much just get notice of the Persians are gone. There's this guy named Alexander. He's in Babylonia. And it's pretty calm because it's like, okay, business as usual, we continue. There does later become an apocryphal, apocryphal being code for wishful thinking, that Alexander made a trip to see the great temple and he saw the name of God inscribed and bowed down before it just in awe of it. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it yeah. does influence even Jewish thought because uh, 
members, we get introduced to theater, we get introduced to Greek literary thought and philosophy, and most importantly, Alexander shows up in Jewish revelations uh, in the book of Daniel when they are describing the advent of God's kingdom. They describe seeing these different throne rooms, one being for the Babylonians, one being for the Persians, and now in this last age before the coming of the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Alexander. So Alexander even figures into what later gets used when people are developing Christianity as well, of having this thought of like, well, I don't quite understand this Messiah concept. We do have this Alexandrian model where Alexander becomes a god. Is that kind of similar? And then things get lost. It turned into a conversation about circumcision. You know, you, you lose a lot of stuff in translation from Hebrew to Greek. So eventually... yeah, and you're right. And then, you know, from your perspective there, the the, the Judaic perspective, the Jewish tradition has that, you know, the the reference there of one of the beasts, one of the beasts in Daniel is is represented by speed. Well, that has to be Alexander, right? Because of, of how fast it happened and, and the things that are going on that are there. But even during the period of time um, after Alexander, again, where the, the Ptolemies are in Greece and the Seleucid Empire is that um, Judah, um, or, Judea, Palestine, pick the name that you're going to identify it by at various points in history, depending on who is 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 contending over it. But it, it, it's this buffer state that goes back and forth between the two. So eventually what you get, you mentioned, you know, Hanukkah flows out of this in, in, in the sense of eventually what happens with the Maccabean revolt is yeah. a lot of that is built around um, who should be the priest. Yeah, who should be the priest and should this foreign power have an influence on the appointment of the priest or how things are practiced, or in the case of um, Antiochus Epiphanes, whose solution coming in defiling the temple and what it means to need to restore the temple and rejuvenate what's going on there. This is all Greek in, it, in its influence in so many ways. And so that's what carries over for centuries after that is this influence from a culture that's been spread to me the other the other um, connection to this that happens later in history is a culture is spread at the point or the tip of a sword or the tip of a phalanx spear in this case greek culture is cast wide because of alexander and his forces conquering where they are eventually something similar will happen after the rise of islam when there's the massive spread that comes uh, as as it spreads, you know, at the at the tip oh. at the tip of a sword as well. Yeah. Also, something I didn't think of the Islamic Golden Age, in which during the European Dark Ages, a lot of these Greek texts are found and translated. So the reason why Columbus, for instance, had maps and all of these different works on mathematics is because in <laughs> Uh, the Islamic kingdoms, they were hiring people to go translate Greek <laughs> into Arabic so that way they could continue the conversation. Right. And, uh, and, the re and the reason they had the Greek text was because there had been there had been Greek invaders that brought that with that brought that with them. Or as I mentioned, you know, to me one of the most one of the places in antiquity I'd love to go is the Library of Alexandria, you know, for all kinds of reasons, or to see even the lighthouse there in Alexandria. Well, what you know there's a collection of texts from all over the world, Greek texts, where in Egypt. Why? Because of Alex, again, this is all this, this influence that we almost just take for granted now because it happened. But you know, that the 10 years where Alexander explodes yeah. across, across the world influences that world for multiple, not just multiple decades after, but for multiple centuries after that. Yeah, Alexander threw a rager that lasted 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and and then influenced, you know, centuries and arguably millennia after that, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and uh, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say, I know I keep harping on the alcoholism and I have a family history of alcoholism. I'm not trying to make light of it. It is a disease. But the thing is, you don't murder multiple people. <laughs> when you drink alexander did right 
And, and, and you know, one of the, one of the, you know, I, I read something in, in preparing for the episode today and, and, and watched something that was similar along the lines of, you might argue that Alexander's success was the result of a youthful zealousness. We've talked about, you know, it's, it, when it works out, it's brilliant, it's daring. When it doesn't, it's foolhardy. Uh, but that's also what you just described there, the inability to rein in maybe certain passions or desires. Or it's also what's the unraveling of what he did. It's what created it. It's also the very things that created it are the seeds that cause it to unravel. Yeah, we know uh, now that the frontal lobe, which handles things like caution and thinking about consequences isn't fully formed until you're around 25. So we also have that to deal with of just like, oh, that would explain why I made so many mistakes when I was 24. Yeah. And, and, and beyond that, when you, when you haven't had to pay for your mistakes, because either, you know, there's something about the daring that works out or you're just lucky, you know, was Alexander lucky or was he good? I would argue from a, from a strategic, from a, tactical military standpoint when you when you hear modern military historians they will tell you he was tactically brilliant he was he was you know a general that everyone there was a reason his battles and his tactical uh, know-how is studied by had have been stored by studied by 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 um, military folks since then he's he's brilliant but he's also lucky <laughs> you know again yeah. and so you know it's it could have just as easily come to an end you know, they're on this, as, as we well pointed out at the start of the episode, it could have come to an end there at Granicus. And, you know, what would we, we know about no what would we know who he was? That, that was going to be my point. What would we know of Alexander today? Well, there would be some who would know him, but he would just be one of thousands of upstart, you know, would be conquerors who uh, died early, <laughs> you know. And, you know, weren't successful. He would just, he would just be a list of folks. He would not be Alexander, again, the great. Honestly, uh, because, his dad, Philip II, might be more well-known to us. I he, think that's probably true, uh, because in some ways, uh, I think Philip actually gets shortchanged historically, because he's, <laughs> he's, his, the typical thing you're going to see as his entry is he's Alexander's dad, right? You're not going to hear about Philip being Philip. You're going to hear about Philip because of that, because of his son. Yeah, even though he obviously he's dead by the time that Alexander does what he does. Yeah. So any other big thoughts we may have missed, Eric? This one's hard also because it's so many, as I mentioned, it has legs. There's so many places you could go that it's, it's sort of hard to contain it down sometimes. Yeah, I would like to discuss a little bit about Persia and what happens to that. Okay. So the ruler at the time of Alexander's invasion is also a newly crowned royal, uh, Darius III. Darius was a member, kind of a minor branch of the Achaemenid uh, dynasty. And because there was a lot of infighting, he would, found himself placed on the throne. Now, he was not a terrible administrator, like he had experience being the governor of Armenia. He had uh, won a battle by fighting an opposing army's champion on one-on-one -on -one combat and prevailed. And he was the head of the delivery service for all of the Persian empire. So he has administrative experience. He's not, I would argue from my point of view, he's not uh, cowardly necessarily, but he's in an empire to where that has been so decentralized and so lacking of a central authority that when he's meeting this unstoppable force, he has no way of adequately responding to it. Because how it worked in Persia was that the noble families would essentially agree amongst themselves, this one family line we will let be in charge, but for the most part, we get to be to our own devices. Right. And it's something we see repeated during the later Roman uh, under Khosrow and Ashirawan, where it's like, it's very rare for there to be a strong central power in Persia. So Darius III gets kind of a bad rap, in my opinion, because it's just like, from a cultural point of view, he would have had to change so much about the inner workings of his society in order to meet Alexander's threat right away. But now, no Alexander, 
he's able to establish a more full lineage, do you think the Persian Empire would, say, become the dominant power of the region, where maybe instead of Greek being the common language of trade, maybe it is Old Persian? I think that's possible. And, you know, there will later be uh, the Parthian Empire that sort of, right, when the, you know, for me, the whole uh, Babylon the Medes, the Persians, it, it's like, it's like a, it's a constant Phoenix story. It's like a new empire rises out of what had been before or adapts what had been before. I, I think a much more assertive Persia would, uh, you know, from the period, I mean, Persia as what Persia was, as you just well pointed out, was decimated by Alexander's conquering. <laughs> and it, yes, it came back, but it came back in a different way because it came back under the influence of what he had done. I think you would have seen a much more assertive Persia. You know, what does Egypt become if it doesn't become Ptolemaic Egypt? In other words, how, how does that, what is that trajectory and how is that different? If you think back to, again, just the Levant there, we've talked about a number of times here. Uh, this goes back to, you know, back to, well, it just goes back uh, to the to the to the Bronze Age, the late Bronze Age. There was constantly um, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Hittites, the Persians, all at various times were growing in influence or waning in influence, but being checks and balances to each other, so that no one empire thoroughly dominated or overcame the other. And I think if you have a stronger, more robust Persia that comes into existence for however long that is without without Alexander doing what he did, th that changes the dynamic in that near term. I think it changes the dynamic in the longer term. Uh, we were talking about off podcast. I can imagine a scenario where 300 years later, as Rome is uh, less than 300 years later, 200 years later, as Rome is pushing east, they're now encountering a much stronger, more established Persian Empire, maybe what has succeeded the Persian Empire, because again, that always seems to be the theme <laughs> of that particular part of the world. But yeah. it, it would not have been um, the Romans usurping Greek territory, Greek culture, coming down for the breadbasket that Egypt always represents, which is what that's about, and the relationship that happened there. I think you might see more of a, a stalwart barrier to Roman expansion as quickly or as thoroughly to the east. So you don't have Roman domination into Asia Minor, into Palestine, into Egypt. And if that's the case, you know, think about how the real legs of this, this fork happen is maybe Rome pushes more east and north if it can't push, I'm sorry, west and north if it can't push as far east. And so you know, is, is, is the history of, you mentioned, uh, you know, mentioned, um, uh, we talk about Gaul, we talk about, you know, Roman influence in Spain. Well, the Romans got as far as, as the British Isles, but they really didn't. They were up there, they dabbled with it, they built a big wall, but, you know, eventually it was, just, that was, that was so far away and so far away from where the, the influence was because there was much more value to pushing east because of access to, trade and riches and everything that came with you know even being even when it had already been established there almost as the silk road almost a millennium before you really think of the silk road being there uh, i think i think you change persia you change alexander you change persia you change persia you change history would be the way yeah. that i would sort of draw that draw that parallel out if i had to like I did on our Cannibal A Blinken episode, just go fully out there about how I think the world would change. I would say Macedon is able to control larger parts of mainland Greece. I don't know if they're still able to keep it all together for themselves, but I think probably stronger hold on mainland Greece. Maybe Parmenion is uh, made the heir to Antipater as like, okay, we are not direct descendants of this bloodline, but essentially it becomes almost close to like the idea of a military kingship where 
best case scenario, it just gets passed on to a series of generals. I think they would start expanding onto the Italian peninsula, bringing them into conflicts with Rome and the Phoenician state of Carthage because they're trying to reinforce those Greek colonies that they've had. Maybe they've decided we're going to spread that way. Persia is insurmountable at this point. Persia, I think, would probably still maintain control over Egypt and the, the Levant. And I think that would start to be seen as like, oh yeah, it's this place of learning. It's this place of commerce. More languages start to resemble Persian. And I think because they don't have Aristotle coming through, we would probably be more familiar with Persian philosophy and Persian music. And we would probably see slavery I'm not going to say it would disappear necessarily, but it would exist to a far less extent because slavery was outlawed within the boundaries of Persia. So I'm seeing kind of this timeline develop of Persia becomes more of an established power, more of the cultural center. Uh, Macedon has taken over most of Greece, but it's still roughly this uh, border state. And Rome is having to contend with these Greek colonies that are denying them full control of the peninsula. I think that's that's all well reasoned, and I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And then I even wonder, you know, sort of giving given the timing here of the late or, you know, the late fourth century BC, you know, BC maybe maybe if Macedon does rise to be something more of a, of a smaller, but still a power there in, in the Greek theater, if you will, you know, and, and you mentioned that if they push more towards uh, the Italian peninsula, you know, do they have the chance of killing or stymieing Rome in enough of an embryonic phase that it never, it, it, it's Rome the Republic, maybe that we know it's the Rome of the Punic Wars, but it never becomes the Rome of the Roman Civil War and then the Rome of the late Republic becoming the Roman Empire. And so, yeah, yes, Rome is an influence because by that point, Rome had already grown to dominate much of the peninsula. They were already in conflict with, as you point out, you know, uh, the Greek colonies that existed there, the Carthage, which is founded from the Phoenicians. <laughs> They've already come into conflict with that. Uh, but, you know, you, there's, more, there's more things that can check Rome under that scenario than what happened in the real timeline. And one of those things that could check Rome at a particular point might be a more inwardly focused, focused on what's going on in, in the area that we know as a Greece, Greece around the Aegean moving into the Italian peninsula, that Macedon may serve that role or somebody else may serve that role in opposition to Macedon and grow out of that. And so there's just a different dynamic with, you know, what I think of as sort of being embryonic, um, embryonic Rome you know does it gets and you know, there's you know, there's always those like key windows of time where if this didn't happen exactly when it did because there was pressure or there wasn't pressure you know would things be different I think the answer is potentially yes um you know if <laughs> Hannibal came really close to you know potentially altering the course of Roman history you know with a Carthage win or a different type of your Carthinian draw, you know, in the latter Punic Wars there, if you have other forces that are, that he can ally with, for example, <laughs> that are willing to, you know, I think you can change the trajectory there pretty dramatically. Oh, yeah. Or if Rome and Carthage have to work together to repel this Greek invasion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I actually was watching uh, something. I may put, I may, if I can find it, I'll put a link in the show notes. I was watching something where they were, uh, it was, the conjecture was what if Rome had settled the new world, which is a pretty uh, big, which is a pretty big conjecture. And one of the first things you have to do is figure out, well, something would have had to gone different where Rome actually would have cared about navies <laughs> for that the same way, for example, the Carthaginians did uh, and, and others that were there you have to you'd have to have something of the order of magnitude of what we're talking about for something like that to even happen right I, I always like to joke with grace of like romans were so dumb they didn't know what boats were <laughs> like i always like to imagine that when the first boat just washed up on their shore they were like what is this is yeah. it a god <laughs> yeah i um it, so i i think that you know to me the interesting 
the interesting thing here is, and I think you hit upon it, and, we, and probably it's worth revisiting at some point. Maybe it'll be a room where it happened when it all, you know, said then it'll be the Library of Alexandria or something before it's all there. But the, um, it's easy for us to talk about the military history there here and the political history of how empires form and don't form. But the influence of those empires forming and not forming is the cultural influence and the philosophical influence. Persian and uh, philosophy, Persian philosophy, philosophies that come more from, you know, call it the Middle East, call it the, the Near Far East, whatever, whatever term you want to use to describe that, are distinct from what we have as Western culture that, that flows from Greek thought, from Aristotle. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, that changes a lot. You know, the, the, this idea that we even have, even though it's a very different thing, the ideas that we have about democracy, you know, owe something to this Athenian idea of democracy, you know, which is a far cry from modern democracy. It's, you know, it, it, it's straining a lot to get there. But as you well point out, organizational structure, culture, education, uh, imagine there's no fall of Rome, so there's no dark ages. And, you know, you continue to have uh, the period of time uh, where knowledge was kept alive. A lot of that knowledge was kept alive in in Persia and in mm -hmm. and, and in and in you know in, in places that we think of today as being the Arab world were very influenced by that as well. Well, I kind of would wonder since Persia, I I would need to do more research to see if they were Zoroastrian at this point, but would, how would that like influence say Judaism to where they are both of these powers who are both oh gosh I'm forgetting the word what's the word when you only have one god Mono, monotheist, monotheistic yeah monotheistic does that create a whole new issue the fact that these are two monotheistic states that are not intimately related but have some uh, archaeological similarities like way back but does that influence the fact that for the rest of the outside world outside of Persia, it's largely polytheist. Does that change anything? Do you mind if I ask you a personal question on this Go ahead. one? Yeah. So how do you think Christianity would be influenced by? Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about that and, and what I really think what I really think about that, because there's no doubt that um, well, the language of the Christian canon, the New Testament, is Greek. Yeah. And um, and much of the philosophical elements that are much of the philosophical elements that have come into even what was first century Judaism. And again, regardless of what you're taking, I am a Christian. Now, I'll say that unabashedly, but whatever oh, yeah. your what, whatever your take is about what first the backdrop of the New Testament, the backdrop of the gospel of the Christian gospels is a very interesting time in in Jewish history <laughs> oh, and, yeah. and 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 it's very much an a Greek influenced Jewish history that is that has come in a couple of different ways there but certainly Greek philosophy is an influential part on the early development of Christianity uh, Gnostic thought and um, yeah, again the language of of the Christian New Testament is Greek, and so it picks up the elements of what it means to be written in Greek. How you can how some things are expressed in Greek, how Greek thought comes into being, and e even you know the the interesting thing there you know the uh, the 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 Jewish Bible <laughs> for that period of time is what we call the Septuagint. It was the Greek translation of of hebrew oh, yeah. and and so you know latin and greek are the are in in in, in the real timeline are the are the languages of of the holy land uh but you know most most jews of the first century a.d are reading their jewish scriptures in again in greek because it's been right. translated it's been translated into Greek because that's the language of the day. And so that has an influence on Christianity. So I think there's no doubt in a Persian dominated culture, I still believe that Christianity would come to exist, but would it be written 
in Greek. It would be written in something else. What would that mean? Would the first missionary activities be more that, you know, the early Christians out of Jerusalem and then the rest of Judea, would they be heading east into Persia more so than heading west into the, Ro the, the Roman dominated areas that had been Greek? I think the answer probably is yes. And to your point about monotheism, Zoroastrianism, um, uh, Judaism, and then Christianity, you know, becoming, growing out of that separately uh, and tied to it, uh, the idea of monotheism is an important part there. I even think about, you know, my, my Old Testament history of the reestablishment of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity is under Persian rulers who are willing to not only permit it, but they sort of fund it and support it. That's how it comes back to be. The, it, as you pointed out, it, you know, we're okay with it. Just pay your taxes and don't cause yeah. any trouble and we're good with this. Uh, you can worship however you want to. We're okay with that as long as it doesn't cross certain boundaries. Uh, if that continues to be the case versus what did happen with other influences that were there, maybe it plays out in a different way. Maybe there's, you know, and ultimately um, Jerusalem is, Jerusalem is laid to waste by Romans. Yeah. And, you know, so may, maybe, maybe there is no, you know, diaspora. Maybe there is no fall of, uh, of things that are there. Right. And for me, so when I was growing up, I came from a new age religious background, AKA uh, what some would call a UFO cult. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Uh, so I got that from my dad's side. And then from my mom's side, she was non-denominational Christian, but she had a Jewish grandparent. So as I grew older and I kind of was more fighting my way, that's kind of towards the tradition. I have been ultimately like, when I think about what I believe, that's where it clearly lines up. I'm still in that process of like fully converting, but I... Like, uh, just the, to quote Thomas Aquinas, like those unmoved movers of history that just seem to <laughs> constantly be shaping us is just so fascinating to me. I do think maybe if it's a more assertive Persian empire that feels threatened by, okay, maybe we've allowed too much that tries to then impose its own religious traditions, maybe that's what Christianity comes out of of that case to where then it's not so much as moving away from Judaism as it is about finding a way to push back against monotheism, kind of like what we saw with, like when they were first writing the New Testament and they had to deal with Marcion, who has just the weirdest version of the New Testament I've ever read. <laughs> Yeah, they, you know, that's the, you know, there's, it, there's interesting things there. And, you know, it's, we, we often don't explore these topics, and we probably should more here on the podcast, because they're the influential topics of what's there, is that, first of all, each person's, I do believe this, I hold to mind, I like the freedom of living in a nation where I'm allowed to express my religious beliefs, and others are as well, that's important to me. But if you don't understand that even if you do believe as I do believe, that I have something that has been divinely inspired and divinely given. It is culturally, it is culturally influenced still. And the setting that it happens in is a culturally influenced setting. And again, um, I think about, I particularly think about the New Testament written, written in Greek. And could the New Testament have been written in any language? I, as a Christian, I believe yes. Yeah. But it, but it would be different if it's not written in Greek. And certainly the, er, the things that were going on in first century, I struggle with what to call it because it's called by so many different things, you know, Palestine by, you know, first century Jerusalem, just to really narrow it down, yeah. is, is you have tremendous Greek influence among uh, some of the, the sects of Judaism at that time. Um, in terms of like the Sadducees, for example, the, which has become a priestly party that derived from being uh, installed to a great degree by the Seleucids, to the Pharisees who are actually 
trying to restore things back to, you know, in their mind, they're, they're the conservatives that are trying to pull it back to what it ought to be kind of thing. This is the philosophical setting of the first century inside of a Roman world that's been Greek influenced. Yeah. If it's if it's a Persian influenced world, it's a different world. And there's a different mindset that goes on there. And I, I, I think that that's fascinating to me, you know, for me, again, I'm glad you asked the question, Eric, because I think it's worth exploring and talking about, is that Christianity grows in many ways in its early phases, whatever you think about it, whether it's an offshoot of Judaism or it's something sort of unique, it grows because it's an oppressed, well, it, it grows because it's oppressed, not in spite of its oppression almost, which is right. true of a lot of movements in that per, if Persia was still the same, where it's, yeah, as long as you're not, as long as you're not upsetting in apple carts, we're okay with it. <laughs> does it, does it grow the same way when it's, when it's maybe not under oppression? Um, or when it's, you know, maybe there's more of them, there's less of a sectarian Judaism that exists that it sort of flows out of in a different way. Does that influence how it grows? I still think it comes to be because that's what I believe. Right. But, I, but I believe that it can, it can come to be in a different way. And don't think for a minute <laughs> that Alexander and the explosion of Greek everything didn't influence this 300 years later because it did. Again, the, the Bible, the Bible of the first century from both Jews and for Christians, when you're talking about the Old Testament or, or yeah. the Jewish or the Jewish scriptures, and eventually it, 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 Islam it is, itself is also going to be deeply. <laughs> right, right. It's, yeah. It, it's the Septuagint. It's Greek. And uh, you, you can't miss that, you know, that the importance of that at any point moving through. Well, uh, let me ask you just one off the cuff question. And I don't mean this to be irreverent. And if it's too far, tell, let me know. Would the gospel of Mark still be as funny <laughs> if it's dealing with Persian, because I, I I read through the Gospels. Mark is my favorite to read about, mostly because I like how frustrated Jesus is by everyone. <laughs> I think my favorite passage is what he says. I know you're going to ask, why do I say your sins are forgiven you? Can't, isn't that not allowed? But would you prefer that I say, get up, walk? <laughs> Fine, let's try it your way. Walk. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I actually, there was a, there, I, I attended a lecture when I was in college on humor in the Bible. So when you start talking about, you know, what's funny in the Bible, you have to look hard for the, for the funny stuff, or you have to understand the context to see what's funny. There's a lot of funny in there, as this lecture was pointed out. Um, even the way, I'll put it this way, even the way that the Gospels are written are very influenced by a Greek way of telling things or organizing things. Um, the gospel, you know, if you look at, you know, the traditional way that most Christians think about this and the way that I think about this, the gospel of Matthew is a very heavily Jewish influenced gospel in terms of how it approaches things. Mm -hmm. Luke is a very Greek kind of gospel in terms of its philosophical point. Mark is actually by many, by many theologians, Christian scholars is thought of as being very much a, it's like the action movie. It's the gospel is action movie. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, it's not so much philosophical. Let me tell you a story. It's let me tell you what he did or didn't do or what you're talking about, what happened there. And then John's a whole other, a whole other animal. John's as, weird. Like, yeah, as, as a gospel, it, it's really more philosophical in, in its bend, picking up on, again, Jewish influence philosophy and, of course, Christ, early Christian philosophy. But back to your, your sort of the premise of what we're talking about here to keep it sort of on topic is would there be a Persian influence gospel? And what yeah. would that look like? What would that look like? Well, I don't know, but it would look different because. There would, there would be a different culture to play it into. You know, there's, there's a famous story that's recorded in the book of Acts where, you know, Paul, who's a Jew, <laughs> yeah. uh, is going around proselytizing. And so he shows up in some of the, the Greek cities. And so he goes to the place where all the Greek thinkers are gathering together. Mm -hmm. And he has to argue for the argument that he's making in a Greek philosophical context. And 
in a different world, in a non-Alexander world, where something different happens at Granicus, first of all, Paul has to learn Persian and not Greek, and he's got to go deliver this to a Zoroastrian uh, point of view or something else that's yeah. coming to play. It would just be different, you know. It would just it would just be different. Or who knows? Maybe monotheism would be super oppressed and we can't even imagine that there was some sort of super Alexander waiting in the wings to come and oppress. Uh, can we just agree? P Paul from Saul is the laziest name change ever. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you know, changed one letter. <laughs> yeah, it, it rhymed. Give them that. It rhymed. Um, yeah. But, um, but again, I, I don't mind you asking the question. I think it's a good thing to talk about here because there is no doubt that the, what I think of in my head is the Alexander Greek explosion. And that's the way that I see it in my head. It's like this explosiveness that happened really quick. The Greek culture got put on the express train and blasted throughout everywhere. And then some of it stuck and some of it di different didn't. Some of it got twisted around or reconfigured in different ways. But without that Greek explosion, and that's, that's the way I see it in my head, without that Greek explosion, it's a very different thing when you get down to the, the time of the, the start of Christianity, or even the years before that. We talk about the influence on Rome or what happens after that. Is, um, it's just a very different, it's a very different world. Yeah. And it, it's, it, it's so different, it's hard for me. I think that's the challenge of this fork in time is it's so different, it's hard for me to even figure out what's different about it, because it's just so different. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be radically different, not just a little bit different, radically different. And it literally gets down to um, two seconds, three seconds. If Cleitus doesn't get there to land that blow on, uh, you know, on the arm as, 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 the, as the blow is about to be struck, I mean, it, 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 is everything we're talking, is everything we know today, quote unquote, Western culture, was it decided in that three seconds? That seems far-fetched, except that it may not be. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, as Chris always likes to say, you know, and asked him, is there anything else? Well, you know, we pretty much just changed everything. What else do you want, Don? You know, kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, kind of approach to thing. I, you know, that... Um, you know, three seconds um, on the side of a hill near a river in modern day Turkey, uh, maybe one of the, you know, five to 10 most critical linchpin moments in all of history as we know today, if you really want to trace it back. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Is the horse dead on the ground know. bleeding? Did, did, did we up, beat it? No, you summed it up so beautifully. It was like a Robert Frost poem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. It, it was meant as a compliment, so please good, do. Good deal. Thanks. Well, Eric, I've enjoyed you joining me today. Happy to have you now being part of what we do on the, on the podcast on a regular basis. And I'll just say to our listeners here, as we always do, uh, Eric's journey can be your journey, too. If you, if you like what we do here, you're excited about what we do, visit the website, you know, throw some topical suggestions in, send us a note, give us some feedback, tell us how we rambled on and on here and we missed the whole point. If that's what you need to do, that's good, too. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in, engage with us. What we're about here is creating a community, as we've said so many times. Uh, one of the things I was, um, I was, I was noting today is as I was talking to somebody today, I was at, so I was mentioning somebody that we were doing the recording today and they were, who are you doing the recording with? I said, well, somebody I didn't know three months ago, but that's the nature of what we do here. And I like the, I like the fact that that's where that's at. I should also mention uh, that, um, uh, I, I mentioned this in the listener update, which came out uh, before this episode. Uh, you didn't hear an ad break today. That's intentional. <laughs> We've decided to, to pull back on those for a while. So we're going to be a little bit more overt in saying that if you, you can support the podcast in a lot of non-financial ways, and we don't expect anyone to support financially. Uh, but if you're interested or thinking about providing financial support to the podcast, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You'll find the link in the show notes for our Patreon page, which is a way to do that on an ongoing basis 
uh, via Patreon, or there's opportunities as a result of PodFan. If, you know, the easier thing for you to do is maybe a one-time gift to the podcast, that'll be put to good use to defray the costs and some of the other things that we do that'll help pr produce the production quality. But as we always like to say, and this is what's most important for me to say, is that uh, you give us the greatest gift that you can give, which is your time. And the fact that you listen to us uh, go on and on about Alexander while you probably have thoughts running through your head, that's the greatest gift that you can give us. As, as a podcast here so we appreciate appreciate you doing that appreciate you coming back each week so eric uh we always ask the question as we close somebody said this is i have to close podcast this way i don't have a choice anymore mm. if if a listener happens upon a fork in time do you have any suggestions for them? maybe what they ought to do well uh if it's your first time listening to a fork in time welcome I would say anything we make is as good as gold here. Uh, <laughs> you are free, of course. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna say I work at a warehouse job and just listening to an argument about whether or not Richard Nixon would ever have agreed to wear makeup on if Lillian Brown had insisted uh, really just turned my day around. So. I really hope that you will enjoy uh, these episodes as much as I have, and I hope you will please write us a review. That, that would be helpful as well. So Eric, thanks, helpful. For thanks for joining us. And uh, uh, as we bid you do here, our suggestion is if you happen upon that fork in time, just go ahead and take it, guys. Thanks. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.